The Centers for Applied Science and Technology, or CAST, is a network of schools focused on experimental learning with a mission to maximize opportunities for students so that they are college ready, career ready, and ready for life. CAST Live is a series of conversations between the CAST schools, community, and San Antonio leaders. Guests share their stories of hope and resilience while answering questions from both students and educators. Today, we are joined by David Robinson, Jr. to have a conversation on the digital divide in San Antonio. David is a founding member of Blueprint Local, uh, in, an investment firm focused on real estate and businesses to promote long-term inclusive economic growth. Prior to Blueprint, Blueprint Local, David led Admiral Capital Group's efforts to make a strong social impact in the cities where the firm invests. For example, Admiral Capital, Capital purchased a Hilton Hotel in Houston, Texas, and created the Admiral Hospital Scholars Program in partnership with Hilton, University of Houston, and local school districts. David's focus was to expand Admiral's platform to making direct impact investments as well as scaling the philanthropic work. Before Admiral Capital Group, David spent three years working for sports and education technology startups in Austin and Eden. David was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in urban and regional planning at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Welcome, David. Hey, everybody. And here's my dad, too. He wanted to wave and, and say hello. How are you guys doing? Good. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Nia. It's, it's a pleasure to join you today and, and excited to talk and, and also really want to listen and hear, you know, kind of how everybody else is experiencing uh, this. <laughs> My dad, this is part of our quarantine. We, we picked up some, some new kittens as, as new members of the family. So what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic and what is your story of hope and resilience? Yeah, I mean, the, I think probably everybody is experiencing the pandemic very, very different ways, but it is a universal thing that we're all going through. So I, I, in my lifetime, I've never, I've never had anything like this happen. Um, I think there's, you know, oh, there's overwhelming just up that's happened. I think we're all trying to digest it in so many different ways. You know, one from, you know, from the health and the public health side and the kind of uncertainty of knowing what's happening. You know, both of my grandparents are, you know, in their 80s and, you know, not in great health. And so understanding, like, can we see them? Like, you know, how do we, like, what does that even look like? And are we putting them at risk? And are we at risk? And, are there, you know, I, we just have no idea. So it's been a lot of uncertainty from that standpoint, from the social standpoint, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and kind of a lot of the, the I mean, police brutality and different inequalities, that's been an entirely different kind of world that we're all trying to grapple with and understand where we fit in and kind of how do you be a part of that change in a, in a positive way. Um, you know, from a business standpoint, we're, it's, it's certainly, you know, our main, my main business is real estate and it's been a, a that world has gotten turned upside down, you know, thinking about space you know, people will use space and people will travel in different ways. People, you know, are people going to go to the office anymore? You know, will they want to rent? Do they want to buy new homes? Like, are they going to leave cities like New York and San Francisco for hopefully cities like San Antonio where they can have better quality of life and have more space for themselves? So I, I think we're, it's just been a whirlwind. You know, personally, um, it has been... A, a time that gotten to spend a ton of time with my family and you know, my, my dad is usually very busy and traveling a lot. And my brothers, you know, one lives in New York and works for NBC as kind of on their, on their talent. My youngest brother was playing basketball at Duke. So we didn't get to spend a ton of time together, you know, without other things going on. So we've, we've been, I mean, to have three months all together, both my brothers came home and we've just been, you know, cooking, hanging out, playing basketball. You know, it feels like we're in high school again. So that's been a really special time that we've kind of gotten to, to spend together. Um, you know, personally, I'm, I'm in school too. So I'm, I'm in a graduate program at UTSA 
studying urban planning. So, you know, during the middle of our semester, we all, you know, everything stopped and we went online for the spring and um, I'm in summer school now and that's online. So then as a student kind of transitioning online, same as y'all. So it's, it's been a whirlwind. I, it's kind of hard to digest. I'm sure, you know, for everybody, there's just so much changing and so much going on. Thank you for taking time out of your quarantine day to come and talk with us. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, we'll now forget, begin our discussion regarding the digital divide in San Antonio. Take it away. Great. Well, I think maybe just a little bit of you know, background on why I'm interested and in kind of why I'm interested in the digital divide and um, where I'm, you know, where I'm coming from, you know, we, when my dad retired from basketball, started a real estate firm and called Admiral Capital Group and really thinking about, you know, can you invest in the community as long as well, you know, in financial ways, but then also thinking about more holistically, you know, how do you be a partner with the community? How do you support the communities that you're investing in, not just being extractive, you know, looking to make money over actually thinking about people. Um, and so, you know, my dad's main passion has been education in the East Side. He started Carver Academy, which is now part of IDEA Public Schools, and uh, both of us are on the board of that. And, you know, always education has been very top of mind for us and, and thinking about how to broaden different opportunities. And, and so personally, I, I started off, I went to UT Austin after high school and started working in the tech world. So worked for an education technology company and then moved to New York working for a sports technology company. Um, and when I was in New York, started getting more involved in Admiral Capital and, and kind of went into finance and real estate. And um, that's what brought me back to San Antonio. And I think the digital divide has been one of those topics that you know, people have, it's been on people's radar, but with COVID, it's, it's been highlighted in a way that you know, nobody's you know, people, it's just been brought to the forefront in, a, in an entirely different way. Um, and, and really thinking about just the economy, you know, thinking about if you don't have access to the internet, you know, especially at home, like you don't have access to the economy. You know, if you're, you, if you are working at a restaurant or, you know, a, have a, a hair salon you, you, and you can't, you know, if that is, you are separated versus somebody who has a white collar job who can, you know, their lives have been able to continue and they've been able to keep working with, you know, I'd say comparatively minimal disruption. And, and so I, I think this is really showing kind of there's a, like a, there's two different worlds for people. There are people who can work online and people who can continue their lives and there are people whose lives have absolutely stopped. And, and you know, I think that digital divide, you know, providing access to the digital economy and then, you know, in the purpose of education, thinking about, you know, who has access to online learning, you know, even if, if there's so much changing in the fall, you know, nobody knows is, are we going to go back to school? You know, is that the right thing to do? That's a very hot topic right now. And so, you know, in the case that we can't go back to school, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like if, you know, the first half or the entire fall semester is online? What does that mean for families? You know, are all families going to be able to get access um, to computers and to internet? And so, I have a short presentation that just kind of frames some of the problem, but then I'd like to really open it up and learn just about y'all's experiences and kind of what are you, you know, what are you experiencing right now and how is that affecting some of your education, you know, on your, your aspirations, but then also just what do you think about the future? So can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay. So just question of, you know, what is the digital divide? The digital divide is, you know, some people can have access, can access the internet and some can't. And, you know, really thinking about when you start to look at the, the breadth of people that can't ac access the internet, you know, it's, it's very divided based off of racial lines, based off of um, economic factors such as income. You know, this, this bottom point right here, people that, and families that have incomes above $150,000 per year have the internet at a rate of 80% versus families with incomes under 25,000 have a rate of less than 20%. I mean, that is just a drastic inequality that, you know, you can see, you know, that it's, 
people, it, that's a very direct showing that if you have money, you know, internet service providers are building fiber by your houses and you can afford to access the internet and you have, you know, cell phone and laptops and tablets and your children have access to that. But, you know, if you, if you're not part of that upper income area, there, there, there's a drastic difference where, you know, a fifth of the people can actually access the internet and have access to education and the digital economy. Now, looking at it like more spatially and kind of where do we stack up, this is 2017 or 16 data. Um, but, you know, looking at, you know, San, where does San Antonio shape up in 2016 of cities that had over 100,000 people, San Antonio is the 15th least connected, um, you know, behind Houston and Detroit being the number one with only percent of their households not having fixed internet access for San Antonio. Uh, about 32, 38.2 percent of our of our households don't have fixed income, uh, fixed internet access at home, which is a crazy, you know, almost 40 percent of people in the city don't have access, you know, to the internet at their houses, which is huge for you know, which is huge for students, especially, you know, thinking about you know, if you need to do your homework. Um, you know, do you want to be going, you know, having to get, a, you know, having to get transportation to a, you know, a public, you know, a bibliotheque or, you know, to a public space, you know, that's, you know, is that safe? Is that what you want to do? I think, you know, having it in your household is incredibly important thinking about how do you access it and how do you live your daily life? Um, you know, spatially kind of looking at San Antonio and where, um, where internet access is prevalent, like you can see, and, and it follows a lot of other kind of demographic trends, you know, in the north side, kind of up north of 410, you know, Alamo Heights and Chavano Park and, you know, every, you know, 281, all of those blue areas have 80 to 100% access to the internet. And this is like high speed quality broadband versus once you get to the side and, you know, Brooks is over here, the east side, those are areas, you know, that match up very well if you look at like incomes, you know, ratios and, and other demographics that don't have access to the internet. So it follows a lot of the other spatial patterns of inequality that we see, you know, not only in San Antonio, but across cities in the U.S. So thinking about, you know, how do you start to approach digital access, you know, what are the ways to provide more digital access? They, you know, there are three legs of the stool of digital inclusion. You know, first is infrastructure. So, you know, broadband fiber and mesh wireless networks and um, MiFi's that provide internet, you know, access at, at the home. And then there's also other parts of this where it's affordability, thinking about, you know, people, can people access devices? Can they afford devices to even access the internet? Can, and then also training, you know, if somebody, does not know how to properly use the devices and this new access, it could be, you know, there's a lot of dangers that come along with the internet. So you got, I mean, thinking about phishing and online fraud. And, and so you can't just, you know, it's not just about providing internet access, it's, it's providing the, the wraparound programs and the training to make sure that people can successfully utilize and make their lives better with it. So, I think one thing that's exciting right now, you know, is that COVID has really highlighted a lot of these, you know, this inequality that existed well, well before COVID. Um, and there's, there's actual funds that are, you know, people are interested in solving this problem. And there's a lot from the academic and business and education world, you know, people are, it's, it has a new spotlight. And just, you know, just from the city of San Antonio, I think $27 million of, of CARES Act funding was dedicated to you know, helping solve some of these issues and and there will be more funding along you know from a federal from state you know it's it's people are thinking about how to solve these issues and so you know one thing that we're really focused on and you know personally really focused on is thinking about the home gap you know digital divide is a very broad range you know from senior citizens and households and parents looking to work but you know very specifically i think what is an immediate problem as we kind of approach the fall semester is thinking about you know, how are students getting access to the own internet and how can we have, provide as much access to students as quickly as possible. Um, and so you, know, you see similar spatial and kind of economic patterns, but 30% you know, of households earning less than 50% a, a year do not have an internet subscription. 
Um, and you know, for San Antonio ISD, the Rivard report said in March that 60% of high school students don't have access to internet at home. And so if we're gonna be going to hybrid solutions or going to be going to um, you know, fully online solutions, how, what, is, what does that mean for the 60% of high school students at, in San Antonio ISD that don't have um, internet access at home? And so there, there are a few different models that people are trying to work on right now that you know, thinking about, you know, is it my fies? You know, are you, are you buying individual devices for students at home or are there longer term solutions that, that could be implemented? So that, that we're, you know, things are kind of rapidly changing. There's a lot of really, you know, smart people. The city of San Antonio has incredible people working on it, but I think it's a very interesting kind of topic think, and it's very relevant to, to y'all's lives um, and all of our lives thinking about, how, you know, how does this, you know, how are we going to solve some of these issues? And the exciting thing is, you know, I think you as students, you know, y'all know the internet and you know computers and you have more digital literacy than most people out there. You're some of the most equipped people to solve this problem right here and right now. So I think this is a time, you know, where y'all can really be and provide a leadership role. It's, it shouldn't be a top-down solution where, you know, City Hall says, students, this is how you're going to use the internet. Um, you should, you can really say, this is how we need, to, you know, this is what we need, and we need funding, and we need, so I think there's a really interesting opportunity for y'all to provide, you know, leadership and, and provide, you know, solve this problem for the city. So I guess I'll stop there because those are a lot of words. Um, but I, I really am curious, you know, for, for some of the high school students, you know, one of the biggest things that's happening is you know, with higher education, you know, so much of the college experience is, is in person. So, you know, with the pandemic, how, I guess, how has this changed kind of your expectations from college and, you know, especially for you know, seniors and, and juniors who are going to be graduating, like, has this like how has this changed your and kind of op changed your thoughts around higher education and some of your your expectations? And a reminder for our audience, you can either answer in the chat or unmute yourself and answer directly. Do you think it's possible to? send homework and school stuff through the mail because if people don't have internet they still have the mail system it, it would be at least a little bit possible to uh send homework through there at least regularly might as well yeah i think that's a great that is a great point you know i think one thing that especially people in like technology and kind of startups, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail and like technology is not the solution. You know, there are low tech solutions that are a lot easier than building, you know, millions of dollars of fiber to new areas. So yeah, I, I think that's a really great point. Um, thinking about, you know, I think there are some considerations on, you know, timing and, you know, how do you coordinate all of that and how do you make sure that, you know, how do you identify people to who, you know, who needs mail service versus internet? I think that's a great solution. Are there any other ideas or any, I, I guess just in your daily lives, like how are people in your lives, whether it be you know, other students or, um, or people in, in the community, how are they adjusting and have you seen lack of internet causing issues for folks? So I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of touch on this topic. I'm a teacher, but also have three children who are also a attending school online. And so our problem was um, everybody started class at nine o'clock. So we all had to be on separate Zoom videos and my wife was working from home too. So we all had to have our technology. We all had to have the bandwidth and um, we had to figure out how to, how to make everything work. Um, having different screens and, and, um, and being all being, um, in our classes at the same time for me teaching, my wife working, and, my, and the kids on there as well. So I, I know how it could be. Yeah, so we all had to, had to um, 
<laughs> how do we how do we do that? Do we get um, you know a, a better provider? Sometimes the internet went down and we were kicked off. So I can definitely see how that can be an issue in, in bigger families um, as well. And we live we live in the kind of in the inner city area, so um, we were we know we had a lot of families around us that, that had um, you know had to access that bandwidth as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, at like a family of eight, you know, is like, what is the solution to that? Even if there's, you know, even if you provide broadband right to the home, then you need eight devices, you know, for people. And is that a scalable solution? Or, you know, is there a way to, you know, have education where, you know, have the classroom experience where you're hearing it, but then the coordination that goes behind it, like it's such a hairy kind of complex oh, issue that you know and and what if and i think another thing is you know that's very interesting that you know is not directly tied but say you know child care is is a major major factor and so you know say if you know if if the student you know if the, if if everything is online in in the fall then kind of what happens with parents you know are they going to have you know if you're in a fast in like in a fast food restaurant you know, are you going you can't leave your kids at home alone um, if they're younger. And so I, I think there's a lot of things, you know, not just devices, but time and like, who's going to take care of, you know, who's going to provide childcare is that's going to be a serious concern. Yeah. And that's, I think another question is kind of like one are like, okay, so I'm a senior and I've been thinking about college and this one of the things that is coming to mind, it's when will I go back? It, it, uh, so like these next two semesters will be fully online for UTSA. Um, I'll be taking, I think, around 24 hours all virtually. So that's going to be a total change because before I only took maybe like two or three classes that really went online. And I had professors that were, she told me, she was like, um, yeah, this is like we threw everything that we ever thought about online learning out of the, out the window. And we started from scratch and we just basically had, they tried to turn an in-person lecture into a an online lecture like you know screen sharing a powerpoint going through and then asking questions and stuff like that but the question is when will when will the campus you know fully open back is it a year or two because you know the timeline of a vaccine is very long you know it's it's it you can't wait for herd immunity you know it's when will we go back and that question does stay on my mind but it's also what other options are there? There is virtual, but you know, it only goes so far. Like how so, much of an impact can you get from a virtual compared to an online? I mean, compared to an in-person. Yeah. So do you feel like you can learn as well in those virtual classes or is there a give and take like or certain subjects? Yeah. So you have, so like, for example, I took the pre-calculus course and that one was a, it was a very big struggle for me taking it online. I felt like I maybe got 50% of how much I would get in person just because you like whenever you're in an online class, there's little things like you can't um, ask questions as frequently, you know, you can't like, um, there's no, um, it, it's just not the same interaction with the teacher. And then there's also that peer to peer connection, you know, like you can reach over to a buddy. Hey, did you, what'd you get on this one? Uh, like this and that. Um, but then you have other classes like English where it's like, it's fine because I can just, you know, I can uh, sit on my laptop and write a five page essay, turn it in by Friday, you know, and that doesn't, that's more um, independent learning um, rather than other courses. So I think it just depends on really the student. Yeah. And from the, I guess from the teacher perspective, I'd be really interested to hear like, you know, what are some of the hard, like some of the challenges, like, I guess, has your job um, undoubtedly it's gotten more challenging but what are some of those challenges and then uh, is, is there anything that you see positives from online from the education and like you know teaching standpoint we're seeing in the chat um, one of the attendees feels that um, science labs have become more difficult to navigate on the uh, online spectrum which I understand probably would be hard to start mixing chemicals on the internet. <laughs> I will say one positive note, um, teaching online is it works around, it can work around students' schedules 
and um, I feel like it can be a little more friendly for students who um, don't really speak up in class. They, they feel a lot um, uh, less anxiety to, uh, to, to speak up sometimes or to ask you a question because they can type it, type it in a chat. And also turning in work, there are multiple ways that you can now turn in work. It doesn't just have to be paper and pencil anymore. They can create projects, videos, uh, posters, um, things that I guess um, students are, are um, more comfortable doing and they can do it with, with a lot more of their, their own personality and their style. So it becomes more authentic. So th that's a, to me, I love that because now students can take that, their learning and project it in their, in their own way instead of just having this format that we have in class sometimes where you have to fill in the bubbles and, and the spaces. And um, it's very teacher centered. Now I feel like we can make it more, more student centered. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed in my classes, you know, like the, the discussion boards, like I guess that's supposed to be taking the kind of class participation. And I, and I think there's positives and negatives. Like, you know, I think there is definitely, you know, it's hard to like have a rich discussion, like in that format. However, you know, there's also, you know, you don't really get to see everybody else's, you know, homework assignments, you know, in a normal class period. So I do think there's, you know, in many ways, is there are opportunities to make that like much more rich and kind of have students learn from each other in different ways that you could have versus you know in class format where you just wouldn't have time to kind of run through every single student's assignment or you know maybe there's a, a selection of assignments that everybody gets to review and learn from and I, I think there's there's something there like that discussion section you know that sharing and like it, there's there's definitely a lot I think there, there's a lot of positive that could be kind of taken. You know, one I saw in the chat that uh, um, it's, you know, um, Devon said that it's been easier for people who live half an hour away. And, you know, thinking about that, I think that's a very good point that, you know, in urban planning, there's a concept of spatial mismatch. And so, you know, thinking about San Antonio, we're such a sprawling city, you know, from, you know, like, you know, Bernie all the way through to, you know, Brooks and even further south and then like SeaWorld. You know, these are, you know, we have miles and miles and miles with not a lot of, um, not a lot of like public transportation options. You know, the bus is, you know, you'd be waiting an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And I mean, you know, at night, you know, it's tough to say it's seven, eight o'clock, you know, is that this type of situation that, you know, you want to be in? And so thinking about with the digital divide, there are some options where, you know, as, as some of these issues get solved, there can be new, like you start to close spatial gaps. And so if you, you know, if you live on the South side previously, the kind of idea was, can you get, you know, can we provide access to retail jobs at La Cantera? And it's like, that's not, you know, that, that might not be the best option versus can we provide, you know, more options for people to get into the digital economy, they can work from wherever they want and they can learn from wherever they want and you can live wherever you want. And so I think there's a lot from a, like that spatial mismatch is thinking about, are, are you spatially disadvantaged by where you are, where you have to own a car to be able to get to access to opportunity? Can you walk places and, you know, what is your physical barriers um, versus the, as things become more digital and there becomes more, you know, digital infrastructure, you start to nullify some of those um, disadvantages. And, you know, the internet is a great, I believe, equalizer, you know, once people have access to it, and once people know how to, like, you know, are, are equipped with the tools to, to use it. So that is, I, I think, from my perspective, something that's encouraging. Um, and even, you know, like programs, like, you know, the Harvard Extension Service, you know, Harvard Extension schools, like, schools like Harvard, they, the only way they're going to survive if they can't do their online, you know, in-person programming is they're going to have to go as broad and as wide as possible. So that means that they're going to, you know, service, services like Harvard are going to go to millions of people, hopefully. And so, you know, programs like Khan Academy, I do think there's a world in which, you know, education is more diversified and reaches more people versus relying just on in-person, but I think there are certainly going to be a lot of growing pains in between that. I guess one, one question for folks, maybe Jason, or thinking about college, you know, college is expensive, and so how do you think about choosing a college, you know, if you're not going to be in-person? Like, does that change the type of college and higher education that you're 
interested in? Yeah, I think it totally does. Like, uh, for example, so if you take Harvard, for example, and you look at their online tuition, it's the exact same as an in-person. So that's like a streaming service you're paying for, but it's live. Um, so that's that's a big, you know, this that's a big con for me. I, I wouldn't pay the exact same amount for an online, the same as an in-person, especially whenever there's free options like YouTube out there. Um, so I, I that plays a big factor in the decision process but also I would rather wait until the in-person comes and then I would rather pay for that rather than paying for an online get half of the amount of I guess half the amount of what I would get in an in-person class and rather get the full thing later on and just maybe focus on something else for the time being but for the I really like your the spatial mismatch it's a great term and I think that internet is what's going to help it. So if like, for example, if you take like working from home, it, it expedited, coronavirus expedited the entire work from home process. There, you have companies such as Twitter, Facebook, um, that all put all of their employees online, but that's because they, they can do that because they all have internet access. And then you have places like in India where there's, you have a lot of these call centers that those people lost their jobs because they couldn't work from home because they didn't have internet. And I think that that spatial mismatch can be closed maybe a little bit with internet, but it also has a lot to do with like the city planning and where money is spent and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, think about, you know, like the department of transportation, you know, the, the building highways, like highways, you know, what the, the construction that they're doing on I-10 and, and 281, those are those are billions of dollars those projects right like i mean and that's those that's to move people but thinking about you know if if we did you know what if we spend millions of dollars connecting people to the internet and maybe they won't need those highways as much yeah um, one, you know, of the things, mentioned... one of the things that came to mind whenever you, you said that earlier was um starlink so starlink uses low orbit satellites to connect globally around the internet to connect everyone in the globe around the internet, into the internet instead of using uh, towers that are based off where people are and where people are willing to spend money. Um, so like you said in that map that it was like the upper north side of San Antonio had more internet connectivity than the lower south, southern part. And that's just because the way that, um, that companies choose where to build towers and where to not. It's where to, where's the money at. Uh, but I think there is more and more options about this this di digital infrastructure and making it more diverse to to not just um you know people that can afford it but um i think it's like really it's now becoming like a basic human right really like yeah no i mean Jadine said it. that in the chat i think you know there's a shift i mean and this is how people used to look at water and like electricity and like electricity used to be like a luxury item for the rich you know and it was not viewed as a utility um, until people realize, you know, everybody should have access to that. And I think we're getting to the point with, with internet service where it's not a luxury item. It's not like, it, it's a basic human need. It's if you don't have access to the internet, it's like not having a, a library, you know, in, in your area. I mean, it, and so it, it, you know, should that be a city or municipal, you know, responsibility to provide that? And then, you know, right now it's a market driven solution. So right now, you know, AT&T and Spectrum like, it is for-profit companies that decide where internet goes and like where they think it's profitable to build and supply internet. And so like, obviously the map, you know, they're going to go to the rich neighborhoods, you know, that's where they're going to, that's where they can make the highest return on their investment. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, with a service like internet that should, you know, theoretically be a, a utility, you know, should it look more like saws or, you know, like that runs our water, that's, you know, or should it look like more like CPS that runs our electricity and power where, you know, it's can be guaranteed that, you know, it's not so market driven. It's more, you know, it can be, you know, obviously you need to be sustainable. You need to have revenue to actually run these services, but you shouldn't be trying to make as much revenue as possible. So that way it can stay affordable and that we can go to as many places um, as possible. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think Spectrum and AT&T, these these are doing a ton um, to kind of, you know, in response in a lot of this, but thinking about just the structure, like the inherent structure of it all, you know, that it's, you know, it's not as necessarily aligned with people who, you know, can't afford it. 
Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of, I, I hope there's going to be a lot of change in that because I think it should be treated more like water or electricity where everybody should have access. Yeah, because if you don't have internet, you don't have news, you don't have, you don't have your schoolwork, you don't have, if you're working from home, you can't work from home, you know, like, yeah, it, it's now becoming basically a human right, <laughs> like, like electricity and like water. I mean, you're totally right about that. That would be interesting to see like a, uh, a city provider, a city internet provider like CPS or SAWS. That would be insane. Yeah. I'm curious, like not just from the academic or side, but socially, I mean, you know, school and, and being together in person is such a big part. Like how, I guess how, you know, not just in the spring, but thinking about the fall, like if you're not in person, like how is, you know, are you able to be fulfilled socially in like this current quarantine environment or like what are ways that you think how could it be better kind of bringing people together making people feel connected like can the internet do that or do you think that places in person rea or interactions the parents um you go. sorry there you go you go um as a parent i can say that it does not replace it uh for what i'm seeing with my three daughters i have 16 a 14 and an 11 year old and um even I can speak for myself, and it does not replace it. Uh, we have tried different things. Even the grandma is going in on Facebook, which is something that I never imagined would happen. And um, that is just not happening. Even on the online classes, uh, when that we saw uh, in the spring, they're very self-disciplined. They're very on target about completing their homework, but the participation was non-existent i couldn't make them go um you know put a, even a picture in there and they wouldn't speak and they were on the live classes um but the, i i couldn't make them it was it was a lot of struggle on that um but i think not everybody is wired to be connected to the internet um and we're just going to experience efficiencies in in um, in relationship. That's what I'm seeing. There is a deficiency. It is not a replacement. Um, I, we can go to difficult. I saw a different range of how the teachers adapted to, um, to educating. Um, but um, I would say that some of them were just like terrible. And I was wondering if it was possible to also the schools or the charters to open up the registration for more students to attend those classes where we know the teachers are really good um, and change that now um, because, you know, they only take a certain amount of students and but I think they should open it to more students. Yeah. That's a great point. I mean, this will probably get me in trouble for saying, but like, you know, the, the concept of a seat, you know, Cast Tech or even for Idea, you know, for Idea Carver, you know, they have a wait list of, of you know, thousands of people. So if, if you're going to be able to go online and you don't have those physical restraint constraints anymore, you know, why not thinking about like school choice, you know, why not really opening that up and thinking about like school districts, like these physical boundaries of school, school districts like what does that matter anymore if if that's the direction we're going in so i do think like thinking about like the structure of how like the way education system is funded and the way like we've gone approach it is very fickle and it's very you know it's very like grounded in the like place um and if place starts to not be as relevant um, thinking like how does that change and, and thinking about like transportation I and mean, school buses and drivers and like all of that it's a very expensive those are expensive items and so or could you redirect some of that could you think about where do you put your funding um, to access to provide you know more more choice to people I, I do think that's a great point Beatrix so we have some questions in the chat um, one specifically for Mr. Neri. 
He wants, he is asking if you can speak on what you think about students who have been provided by the district with access to technology and provided with opportunities to learn and help from teachers, but are advantage of the opportunities, not, in not attending class and not turning in work despite having those tools at their fingertips. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think you can't, like, you can't not try, you know, <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of, I mean, we're trying to like, I, I mean, we're, there's going to be a lot of growing pains trying to understand how each person learns, how they take advantage of opportunity. I think you got to just, you know, we're going to have to assume the best um, of people and kind of, you know, if you, if you don't do that, like you can't kind of make progress. And so I, I think you have, I think we're going to have to, especially in these like turbulent times, like assume the best and kind of operate out of that. And if people don't take advantage, that's their loss. But, you know, that's, I think that should be their choice um, to use it. Again, as from a parent perspective and from what I've heard from other uh, friends, parents, so I have two children that are very self-disciplined and, um, I mean, they were on time to their classes. They were turning on their um, work. Um, I have, um, my youngest one is 11 years old and she has Down syndrome. It required a lot of time. And I'm not gonna talk about the deficiency of what it was provided, but I was working full time from home. And then I could just not sit down with her uh, and do all the teaching because that's what it was required. Um, so it wasn't, yeah, they gave us an, an iPad, but that was not uh, enough. And then what it was provided was not enough for me to teach her. Um, and then I've heard from other parents, other, where the child is just not self-disciplined. They have to go out and work. You're talking about a 16-year-old or 15-year-old, and they know the, the child, they know they cannot make them do that. So what about those students that they just don't have it in them? And we're not going to talk about, you know, bad parenting or whatever. It, it, I don't think it matters. What matters is what is going to happen with that student that doesn't have the support from a parent, either by choice or because they just don't care or whatever. What is going to happen? So, Many times it's not because they choose not to take advantage of what is provided. It's just that the structure for them to learn long distance is not there. And uh, I'm worried about that kind of student that um, is, you know, are they going to be dropped? Or what? It's like, oh, well, too bad. So I think there has to be a lot of thought about those kind of students that they really need to attend school absolutely i mean i think we should be approaching this with the understanding that we don't know what we're doing and this is new for everybody and like very opened eyes you know like that's i mean that's i think with students you know like you know adults seem like they have it all put together but you know we don't we don't know what we're doing we're all trying to kind of do this together and especially in these types of times so that's i think that's that's a i mean i think that that specifically is a, a great place where students could provide a ton of guidance and a ton of leadership. It's like, how do you help connect your peers that, you know, adults might never be able to reach or might not even know having struggles or, you know, like that, that, you know, that, that is a type, that's the exact type of issue where, you know, you're best positioned to take a leadership role and, and solve problems. So we have another question. Um, this one is from Ms. Russell, and she wanted to know if you had heard about challenges either in rural areas or where hotspots didn't work in cases where families are sharing and it makes it more difficult, and are there some infrastructure or workarounds in the works? Yeah, I mean, rural is, it's an entirely different animal. Um, you know, I think the, it, and you know, I, I think like Starlink and a lot of these satellite and I, I think those are probably some of the m most promising solutions. But with, you know, the, I think the first part is that infrastructure. So especially, you know, San Antonio, we're actually very lucky. We have a pretty broad 
um, network of fiber that's already been laid. The issue is more like that last mile connection, connecting from the fiber to the homes. That's much more of our issue versus like having fiber versus kind of, you know, like rural, you know, in, you, know, uh, you know, outside of Abilene, Texas, where you know, it's, it's gonna be expensive. You need 50, $60 million to, lie, to actually lay fiber to reach, you know, a hundred households. And so I, I think there is kind of, you know, there, it is market driven and, and for rural, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's been hard for companies to make economic sense of, of laying that very expensive infrastructure. Um, and so the, I, there, it's a very tough challenge. I do think like satellite internet and hopefully Elon Musk can solve that problem for us. But um, it's that, that's a very big, very big challenge. These cities are different because you have the economies of scale and you can, you, it, it makes more sense to put those capital investments in because you can reach so many more people. But, you know, for the, for the internet providers, it does come down to customers, you know, thinking about if I'm going to spend, you know, a hundred dollars, how many customers can I reach? Um, and, and so in a city in denser populations, you know, you just have more customers that you reach for your capital expenditures versus in rural areas that works against you because people are much more dispersed. You know, you, you're still building physical infrastructure, you know? And so, you know, if you're having to build miles to reach one household each time, that's very inefficient. And so, you know, people haven't served a lot of those areas. Thank you, David, so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Join us on Thursday, July 30th for our next CAST Live event, where CAST students share their internship stories. Thank you again, David, for joining us and giving us all this insight on everything, and we hope that all the attendees had a wonderful time. Yeah, thank you, everybody. It's been great to connect, and thank you for talking and, and you know, interacting. Thank you for joining us today. We are CAST.